don't know if you can see from there. You may not be able to see the, uh, the details of the banner, but in the next uh, several weeks as you are here, maybe a little bit earlier before church or afterwards, walk up and you'll see that that banner has a multitude of people uh, there, a uh, picture there of, of heaven, and a multitude of people there under the ray and uh, the, the brightness of God, certainly. And uh, they're just there worshiping, magnifying God. You know, the Bible says, uh, one day every knee will bow. And it says, every, uh, someday every tongue confess that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we serve that God. And I don't want to wait until heaven to magnify God. I want to begin that right now. And, uh, and what's that do? That brings a little bit of heaven down here as we live our lives to magnify the God who certainly deserves that magnification. If you see our verse in Psalm 34, if you've closed your Bible, open it again briefly, if you would, to Psalm 34. And we see in verse 3, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. You know, this verse uh, that we're looking at is a theme for our verse. This verse uh, could be a husband and wife uh, verse that you could choose as a husband and wife to be the theme of, theme of your marriage. And uh, what a great verse to say, you know, honey, I, I think this will be our verse that we're going to use as a couple that, uh, that our marriage and all that we do and all that we say and how we live our lives and how we, uh, you know, uh, uh, interact with people, all the things that we do, we want our marriage to be one that is what? Magnifies the Lord. But you know, not just a verse that a husband and wife can choose, but this could be a verse that a, a mom and dad can choose to be the theme of their home. And it says, you know, honey, I think that God has blessed us with some wonderful children. And I want our home uh, to be a home that magnifies God. And I want that home to be where our children are raised in an environment where they know about the greatness and the awesomeness and the magnificence of God. And uh, wouldn't that be a great theme for a marriage? And wouldn't that be a great theme for a home and a family saying that our home is built on the foundation with a focal point? of magnifying God. It can also be a great theme uh, as we've set aside this year for a church to choose a theme for their ministry, but not just a yearly ministry. It can really be a ministry mission statement uh, that we could put, you know, a lot of uh, corporations and businesses don't have a, uh, you know, their, their mission statement and, and uh, sort of their founding uh, doctrines of, of what they're going to build their foundation upon. And uh, what a great mission statement for our church to have. Uh, not just this year, we're wonderful, 2024, that's great, but what a great about a mission statement that we want to magnify God and exalt His name together. Now, each of us are to individually magnify God. That's something that we're to do unrelated if anybody else does it. If you're the only one in your marriage that magnifies God, then magnify God. Uh, if you're the only one in your home that magnifies God, then you be the one that magnifies God. Uh, if you're the only one in your church that chooses to magnify God, then you as an individual choose to magnify God. Uh, but we shouldn't just uh, stop there. We should also desire to join our lives with others to do the same thing together. And that's what this verse is talking about. It's not just about me magnifying God, but it's about joining myself with others. It's an invitation saying, let us, it says, well, magnify the Lord with me. There's an invitation that I want you to become a part of, of my life as I and us together can magnify God. Then it says, let us exalt his name together. And so all of us should do, be doing such a wonderful job in magnifying God that our wife or our husband uh, wants to also magnify God with you. Uh, your children will also want to magnify God with you. Uh, your fellow church family will also want to magnify together uh, with you. And then all of us as a couple, as a family, as a church family can together magnify God. Just imagine, just imagine the impact that could be accomplished if we would join with others within our marriage, within our home, within our church, to exalt the name of God together in ways that cannot happen individually. There's just some things that cannot be done individually, but together can be accomplished so much more. That can only happen 
as we do it corporately together. You know, the Bible says you ought to pray, and uh, you can get some great answers to prayer, uh, praying individually. But the Bible also says where two or three are gathered together in my name uh, and pray. And uh, what's he saying? There's some prayers that won't be answered just because you're the one praying it. You've got to get others to join with you, uh, to together with you. And as you pray together for that, God will see something miraculous happen in your life. In addition to you just praying, you're praying together. And so the same thing in regards to magnifying God. I can magnify God. Oh, but you get two of us magnifying God. And then you get four of us magnifying God. And then you get 12, and then you begin to multiply. Can you imagine the impact that we can have for the cause of Christ if we got this thought and began to implement this in our life of magnifying God? Now, magnifying God, I'm giving you two thoughts this morning will be done uh, as we build a foundation for this year. Number one is this. Magnifying God gives us a God-focused perspective. A God-focused perspective uh, in, your, in regards to your life. And the word magnify or the word magnify is used a couple of dozen times in the Bible. But most of the time in reference to the Bible, it's in reference to us, man, magnifying ourselves above God. It's us wanting to be exalted above God. It's us wanting to be honored above God. And so usually when we see the word magnified or the word magnified in the word of God, it's used in a negative sense where we're trying to exalt ourselves above God. And, and so we see then that we're certainly prideful individuals by nature, and we certainly do a lot of things, don't we, to try to make our, ourselves bigger in the eyes of others. We want them to think that we're somebody, and uh, we drive a certain car, or we uh, dress a certain way, or uh, we've got a certain image we're trying to keep, and, and we want others to see how big we are, and how important we are, how significant that we are. And that's really the problem, I believe, today with the world, is there's two little of a view of God and there's much too big of a view of self and it's all about look at me and look what I've accomplished and look what I've done and there's little if any impact of making much of magnifying of exalting God in our world today you see if your life's pursuit uh, today is your life's a, pur a pursuit the magnification of yourself or is your life pursuit the magnification of God? Do you want to magnify God with your life? Or do you want to magnify yourself with your life? You're doing one of the two. And your objective today is to do one of the two to make much of yourself and your image and your impression. Or to make much of God and uh, what God is in your life. The Bible is very clear that we're to magnify God. Now what does it mean to magnify God? It means to make Him large in our lives. It means to make him big in our lives. Uh, it may, means to make him uh, uh, large so that uh, he's not some undercover God. He's not some secret God. Uh, when you go to, to work, uh, you serve a big God. Uh, when you walk in this world, you serve a big God. And when you get God, who's as big as God on the inside, it's hard to hide that God from the world and the eyes of others. And so it's making God large in our lives. Now I'm sure uh, you've noticed that an object looks small from far away. But as you get near and approach that object, uh, it appears to get bigger, doesn't it? And uh, you look from a long distance, it seems small, but as you get closer to it and approach it, it seems to get larger. The object did not get any bigger than it already was. But as you draw near to that object, your perspective or your view of that object began to change. And so you getting closer to it didn't make it bigger, but how you viewed it made it bigger. Uh, how you perceived it made it bigger. And, and so God wants us uh, to make him big. I can't make God bigger uh, than he already is, but my perspective of God can make God as big as he is. How I view God can make God as big as he is. It doesn't make him any bigger in magnifying the Lord. It doesn't make him any grander, but allows me to see and to view and to perceive him in just that way. Now, once you're face to face with that object, you see it 
in its full size. You begin to enjoy and experience it and embrace it. This is the bigness and the grandeur of how big this truly is. You can drive and go on a road, uh, cross-country trip and a road trip, and you can see if in the distance, maybe the Grand Tetons. You can see in the distance, uh, and you see it, it, it looks pretty big. And uh, But as you get closer, as you get a little bit closer, and the miles begin to run behind you, all of a sudden, you now begin to see the grandeur and the greatness and the magnificence and the bigness of that, ma- that, of that mountain peak. And uh, it was no bigger than it was when you're a thousand miles away or a hundred miles away. But as you get closer, you begin to realize, wow, that is a big, big uh, mountain uh, range. And you begin to see the awesomeness of that mountain range. This is how we're to magnify God. As we draw near to Him, we see Him as He is. And the larger than anyone or anything could ever see, the more we get closer to Him face to face with God. You see Him as He really is. That's why in James chapter 4, verse number 8, the Bible says, Draw nigh to God. And he'll draw an eye to you. See, our problem is we're a distance from God. We're away from God. And God says, get closer to me. See how big I am. Uh, as you desire to get closer to me, then I'll get closer to you. And you'll see how awesome I am, how big I am. And the bigger God is, the stronger what? The stronger your faith is. You say, I don't, I don't have much faith. I'm overwhelmed with worry, fear, anxiety, uncertainty. I'm overcome with all these things. You know why? Because you make the problem bigger than it really is and God is not as big as he really is but as you draw nigh to God and you see God in his bigness all of a sudden the problems that we have don't seem nearly as big the worries that we once had don't seem as as needful to worry about why because we're drawing near to God we're getting close to God oh magnify the Lord what's that mean make God big in your life you don't serve a little God you serve a big God you don't serve some an incidental God you serve an amazing God but does the world know does your family know does your neighbors know how big God is by looking at your life are you magnifying God so others can come to the invitation come and magnify the Lord with me so together we can exalt his name together we can magnify his name together and so we see that drawing near as we draw near to God through spending time in his word through spending time in prayer through our faithful church attendance uh, in times of worship we enter in the presence of God through these various avenues we get closer to God and in the presence of God our perspectives change in the nearness of God our view of life changes things that bother us don't bother us things that cause fear don't cause fear things that cause worry don't cause worry why we see how big God is oh magnify magnify the Lord and as you begin to see again not make him bigger than he is but allow your perception how you view him how you see him uh, the reason God seems so small is because we're a long ways away from God As we near ourselves unto him, we begin to see the greatness of God. You see, magnifying God comes as a result of getting close to God. And so this year's theme of magnify the Lord is a a challenge to the motivation. Saying, I want to get closer to God this year. I won't be able to see the bigness of God unless I get closer to him this year. Uh, If I stay the same distance from God today and this year as I was last year, then God's not going to be any bigger in my life this year. My faith isn't going to grow any bigger this year. Uh, The magnitude of how awesome God is isn't going to grow this year. But if I can get closer to God this year and draw near to God, then God's going to grow my faith and it's going to get bigger and stronger. But the greatness of God is what's going to allow that faith to grow to a much bigger size. You see, when I get close to God, we experience His presence. We see God as great, and when we see Him as great, what happens? Greatly to be praised. The result of seeing the greatness of God is a joy, it's a gladness, it's a happiness, it's a thrill that comes. But if you don't see God as being big and great and awesome and magnified, then we've got nothing to rejoice and be glad about but when you see how big God is all of a sudden you look at God in comparison to what trials you'll face this year and what burns you have to bear this year and what tragedies and hardships you'll go through this year but when you see the bigness of God you'll be able to rejoice because you know God is so much bigger amen so much bigger than anything that we'll ever have to face in 2024 when David says oh magnify the Lord he's showing us how to live a God-focused God-centered, 
God-honoring life. He said, listen, this is how to get your life focused. This is how to get your life centered right and get your focus right so you can start the year right in 2024. You can go down the right path and reach the right goals. Why? Your focus is right. You're centered. You're magnifying God in every area of your life. Oh, magnify, David says, the Lord with me. I want you to see what greatness God is and what greatness God has done. I want you to join with me and experience the greatness of God so together we can exalt His name. So others will want what we have and will join with us and then together with additional ones we can then glory and magnify God. And so David says, I want to show you how to live a God focused life. You see, a God-focused life begins when we realize that the source of everything is the Lord. That's a God-focused life. Everything that you have is because of God. Everything you enjoy is because of God. The, the, the family you have is because of God. The husband and wife you have is because of God. The children that you have is because of God. The job you have, the home you live in, the car you drive, the stuff you have, it's all by God. And so a God-focused life realizes everything finds its source and beginning in God. Everything we have is because of God. But a God-focused life also means that God is a motivation for everything that we think and say and do. Why do you do that? I want God to be magnified. Why do you talk that way? I want God to be magnified. Why don't you do those things? I want God to be magnified. Why don't you say those things? Because I want God to be magnified. So it not only affects every area of our life, but also affects uh, the motivation for everything that we think and do. Many of us leave so little room for Christ in our Christianity. It's so much about me and my problems and my trials and what I'm going through that we leave little uh, space for Christ to be a part of our Christianity. And do you not understand the very base of Christianity is Christ. It's not about me. Uh, I'm not a part of the picture. It's all about Him. And so a God-focused life realizes everything, the motivation for everything. Why are you here in church today? I want to magnify God on this Sunday. How, why do you live for God throughout the week? I want to magnify God. Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you uh, live a good life of testimony? I want to magnify God with my life. A God-focused life also has one ultimate goal, God's glory. That's the goal. Why do you do what you do? A God-focused life says, I want God to be glorified. I want God to be glorified. And if God can't be glorified in what I say, I'm not going to say it. If God's not going to be glorified in what I do, I'm not going to do it. If God's not going to be glorified in how I behave, I'm not going to behave that way. If God's not going to be glorified, then I don't want to do it. I don't want to be involved in it. I only, my goal, my motivation, uh, everything I do, everything a part of who I am, the ultimate goal is what? To give God glory in my life. Now, there's two methods of magnification. There's two methods that we can magnify something. The first method is a microscope magnification, and then there's a telescope magnification. Two types of magnification, so magnify the Lord. What are we talking about? It says two types. Okay, either uh, we, we take a, a microscope magnification or a telescope magnif magnifying. Now, a microscope, microscope uh, magnifying takes something small and makes it bigger than it is. Remember in your biology class and, and they put the little, uh, your blood sample or whatever else on that little disc and you zoomed in and, and got that thing. And it allows us to see what is minuscule, what is naked to the, the, the naked eye, un, unseen to the naked eye. And it allows you under, my, under microscopic magnification, it takes something very, very small and makes it big. So that we can begin to see the intricacies and the, and the, 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 the framework and the makeup uh, of that magnification. It allows you to examine something much, much more closely. A telescope, though, on the other hand, mag uh, magnif magnifying of a telescope, takes something enormous, takes something huge. But because it's so far away, you can't really see what it really looks like. And it doesn't look real big. It doesn't look real magnificent. It doesn't look real uh, amazing. And so you got a microscope. It magnifies. It makes big something that's little. A telescope takes something that's enormous. It's big and allows us to, but looks small. And it allows us to see how big 
that, that object is. Now, you know the problem with most of us as Christians? Uh, we're microscope Christians, aren't we? And uh, we take things that come into our life that are not that big of a deal. When you see the bigness of God, and we'll take this uh, thing that happens in our life, and we'll make it bigger than it really is, and, and we'll make a mountain out of a molehill, and we'll make something much more enormous than it really is, and we take something that's very little, and we make it big, and God says, don't be a microscope Christian. I want you to be a telescope Christian. I want your focus not to be on some little problem and some little inconvenience and some little trial you're going through and some little burden you have to bear. I want you to get your focus, get your telescope out and see the bigness of God. And when you see that, you begin to see, I've got nothing to be fearful about. I'm not going to make big of this little thing and I'm not going to make much of this insignificant thing. I'm going to make much of how big God is. And again, a telescope doesn't make that planet or that star any bigger than it already is, but allows us to see the bigness of that object in a way that we would not see it without that telescope to magnify it. You see, the telescope makes it look bigger so we can see what it looks like, so we can be awed by its splendor and beauty, so we can be amazed and, and wonder, like, wow, that is amazing. It's like the pictures taken from the Webb Space Tele Telescope uh, called the Webb. It's currently the largest telescope, uh, powerful telescope ever launched into space just a couple of years ago. The Webb Telescope sits in a stable orbit one million miles from the Earth. And it can capture images of objects 100 times less bright than the Hubble Space Telescope could. According to NASA, the Webb telescope is so sensitive to infrared light, it would be able to, read, be able to detect even the slight heat of a bumblebee at the distance of the moon. The Webb telescope can take that which we've always talked about, the Hubble telescope. It can take things that, that are, are 100 times less bright that even the Hubble telescope cannot grab a hold of and take a picture of and be able to visualize and it can see beyond that much much further and be able to see things that even the Hubble telescope cannot see you see a telescope uh, enables us to take something big like a star that is much bigger than the earth and pull it closer so we can analyze it and see in it's all what in all its glory and what it really is we see it's like, wow, that's amazing. We're on our planet. We think we're all self-sufficient and we're the big, big guy on the blob. And, uh, but when you begin to look out in the universe, you begin to realize that we're nothing compared to the creation of God beyond what our eyes can see and what looks so insignificant and so unimportant. But through the help of a telescope, we can see the vastness and the bigness and the glory of the vastness of our universe that's around us that we can never see just by looking up and, and saying, well, yeah, look at all those stars up there. But we still realize how big we are, how important we are, how significant that we are in our lives. And so we see then, take your Bibles and uh, go to Psalm 40, just over a, a page or two. And so we see that that telescope, let's tie this down uh, to magnifying God. A telescope enables us to take something big, like that star uh, that's so much bigger than us, and put it closer so we can analyze it and see it in its what? Full glory. Full glory. And don't you think that's what God wants of you and I? He doesn't want you to see him as some little speck of dust. He didn't want you to see himself as just some little a trivial something randomly up there. He wants you to see his fullness of glory. He wants you to see the greatness of who he is, the magnificence of who he is. That's the God that says, I want you to magnify me. I want you to make much of who God is. See the bigness of God. Look in Psalm 40, verse number 5. Look what David says. Where he says, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works. I want you to highlight or look at that word, many. Many. Many, O Lord, my God, are what? Many are thy wonderful works. And what? Many, uh, which thou hast done. You've done so many things. And thy thoughts, which are to us, were, they're, they're many. So many are thy wonderful works. And many things that thou hast done. And many thoughts that you have uh, towards us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. Uh, if I would speak and, 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 and declare, uh, declare and speak of that, they are more than can 
be numbered. He said, listen, uh, as I look up to God, I, I see the, the many wonders of God, but Lord, your works and your thoughts and your actions and your deeds are so beyond my ability, I can't even reckon. I can't even truly visualize how awesome of a God you are, how big of a God you are, how many wonderful things you truly do. I can't really see it. I can't recognize it. I can't recall all that. In fact, it's more than can be numbered. As we look up at the night sky, full of its many wonders, where we cannot even number all the stars that we can see as we look into the night sky on a clear night, God, like that night sky, is full of wonders, so much so they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. But here's a problem, is that in the night sky, the wonders of the heaven don't appear as they really are. They seem small, and they don't seem very bright. They don't seem very, seem very awesome. So what do we do? We magnify them. That's what a telescope is for. I'm not making them bigger than they are. I'm just allowing you to see how big they are. I'm not imagining something that's not there. I want us to truly see them as they are. And so we put out the telescope to magnify the heavens and allow us to see the wonders of God's creation, the stars and the bigness and the vastness of those stars that are there. Likewise, can you imagine and magnify the wonders of God and show, can you imagine this? If you're going to magnify the wonders of the night sky and show how amazingly big it is, I'll be more amazed. I'll be more thrilled. I'll be more excited. Why? Because I want to see the grandeur. I want to see the, the bigness of, of the universe. And if you can magnify the wonders of God and show me how amazing and awesome God is, I'll be more amazed. Let me tell you something. The world's not amazed in the God that we serve because they don't see a big God. They see Christians that walk in fear. They see Christians that are always worried, upset. They're, they're tossed to and fro. They have no stability. They're not steadfast. They don't see a God that's an amazing God. And there is no need to invite them to magnify God with us because they don't see us serving a God that's big. By listening to our conversation, they would never know we have a big God. By hearing all of our complaints and gripes, they would never know that we serve a big God. By seeing how we doubt and walk in fear and anxiety, they never know we have a big God. But God said, listen, as vast as the universe is, I want you to see the wonders of the constellations. That's what a telescope's for. And God said, I want you to see the wonders of what God is in the eyes of others. And God says, that's your job, to see the bigness of God so others will want to have and know the God that we serve. I wonder if your co-workers are not resp responsive to your invites because you're no greater in magnifying God than they do. Uh, and so we see today that God says, I want to be magnified. It's impossible to make God bigger, but you can see him bigger. You can see him bigger. And that's what faith is all about. Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Grow our faith in 2024. Uh, we want more faith in 2024. What's that mean? More faith means I see a bigger God. I see God who he really is. God is growing in my eyes. Not that God is bigger than he already is, but I'm seeing him as a big God. I'm viewing him as a big God. I perceive him as a big God. And the bigger God he is, the greater your faith is because you see how big God is. Your confidence, your trust, uh, your, your, uh, your, 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 your calmness of spirit during the storms of life is there. Why? Because God is being magnified in your life. And so a magnifying glass does not make the words on the page any bigger, right? Doesn't make them any bigger, but allows it to, to be appear to be bigger. It allows it to be appear, your visual, your viewpoint. So the question is this, how big is your God? How big is your God? Now, we can say, oh, he's a big God. Oh, no, you, you say how big your God is by how you live your life. You say how big your God is by your conversations. You say how big your God is by the thoughts you think and, and are you consumed with worry and uncertainty and anxiety and fear? Or do you serve a God and you realize, I'm not going to think those thoughts of fear. Why? I serve a big God. I'm not going to magnify through a magnifying or through, uh, through a, a, a microscope. Those things are very small and make them bigger than they really are. I want the telescope to magnify the bigness of God. So my focus is on Him. 
not on the littleness that's being made big in our lives. And that's what Satan will do. He'll bring across a slide and have a, a, a microscope and say, hey, look at this problem. And you become so consumed with the problem, you say, wow, I, there's no way I can make it through that. Yeah, you've allowed the devil to deceive you into thinking it's bigger than it really is. It's not nearly as big if you got the telescope focused on the greatness of God and magnifying God as God desires to be magnified. And so what is needed in our world today, uh, like ours, is a church which, de- which uh, does for God what the web telescope does for the comets and the stars. What's needed is a church, a people of God, that magnifies God like a telescope, a church which calls with others to stop and think of God not as small but to think of God as big and great as he really is that's your job that's my job that's the purpose of our church is to let the world know we serve a big God a great God and the only hope you'll have of finding fulfillment and forgiveness and a purpose of living life is to know that God in your life he's an awesome God he's a great God and that's our mission to be a telescope to a world that knows and sees not the bigness of God and we through our life and our testimony and our attitude and our conversation can be that lens they look through and they see how big and amazing God is and they says I want that God in my life I've got some problems that are pretty big I got some worries that are pretty big I got some trials I'm going through that are pretty big I'd like to have a big God like that so I said number one If we're going to understand this thing about uh, magnification, magnifying God gives us a God-focused perspective. And may I say finally, God's uh, magnifying God not only gives us a God-focused perspective, but also gives us purpose to live life. It gives us purpose for our life if we have magnifying God. In Psalm 34, 3, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Right here in these few words, we have a statement of the chief end of man, the sole purpose of our lives. People say, well, I wish I knew what my purpose was. I wish I knew why I was here. I, knew, I wish I, would, I just knew why what my purpose and why, why God put me here. I'm going through some hard times, and, and I've had a rough road, and I wish I knew why. Let me tell you why today, uh, based on your past or based upon your lifestyle today, your purpose is to go, uh, magnify God, to glorify God, to make God big in whatever life stage you're at today. That's your purpose is to magnify God. So many people live a purposeless life. They have no, des- no idea what their purpose is. They retire. They lose their purpose. The kids leave the house. They lose their purpose. A spouse dies. They lose their purpose. They lose their job. They lose their purpose. But may I tell you, your purpose in life, God's chief end for each of us is given in this verse, oh, magnify the Lord. So magnifying God tells you what you're supposed to do at home. It tells you what you're supposed to do at work. It tells you what you're supposed to do at school. It tells you what you're supposed to do with your friends. It tells you what you're supposed to do in life. Oh, magnify the Lord. It defines the purpose for which we're to live our lives, magnifying God. So as an employee, you may work in a warehouse, but your real job is to magnify God. That's your real job, to magnify God uh, and uh, uh, as you do your assigned task at work. As a husband, you may be the leader of your home, but your overall purpose is to magnify God as you lead your family. As a wife, you may be a wonderful homemaker and a housewife, but your home assignment is to magnify God. That's your purpose. It defines everything that you do. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose in life, no matter what you accomplish, you'll end up feeling like a failure. There'll be a barrenness in your soul. Why? Because your purpose of life is to glorify Him in whatever avenue, whatever area, whatever purpose place you have, your life today is to glorify God in your life. Uh, we see in Psalm 14, Psalm 40. Can you turn there briefly with me, if you would? Psalm 40 and verse number 16. Psalm 40. We see twice David makes this uh, uh, rep- repeats this thought in Psalm 40 and Psalm 70. Look at Psalm 40, verse 16. First, let all those that seek thee rejoice. And be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. The Lord be magnified. Go to Psalm 70. Psalm 70 and verse number 4, we see the same thing repeated other than saying the Lord. He says, let God. Psalm 70 verse 4, let all those that seek thee, what? Rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God 
be magnified. In other words, who, those of us who love their salvation have a God-appointed mission. What is that to do? To say continually, let God be magnified. To say continually, let the Lord be magnified. If you love your salvation, you'll want to magnify the Lord. And so God said, if, if you love that, he says, uh, uh, those that uh, uh, let such as love thy salvation say continually, uh, let's say what? The Lord be magnified. And so my prayer for this year, for my life, for my marriage, for my home, for my church is this, is that Lighthouse Baptist Church would grow to be a collective telescope for the greatness of God, making God look as great as he really is and helping people wake up to what he really is like and let the world see him the way he really is, not how the media portrays him, not how they were raised, but how God really is revealed through the word of God. They can see him the way that he is magnified. Our mission is a theological astronomy, uh, seeing the vast glories of God in Christ Jesus and magnifying them for our city and for the joy for all the world to see. You see, God has given us a focus and a clear and simple message. We exist to what? Say continually, to live continually, to show continually what? That the Lord is magnified. That's your purpose. And so that verse defines your purpose in life. If you're not fulfilling that purpose, there's a void in your heart. I don't care how, what your promotion was last year. I don't care uh, what house you got or what is in your bank account or what you have. If you've not lived your life with a sole purpose of allowing God to be magnified, it's all futile, it's all empty, it's all vanity, it's all vain, it's all empty. It's not worth it. There's nothing that satisfies because you've not fulfilled the reason that you've been put in this world. And so we see then David says the word continually. Notice what he says. Uh, he says what? He says, I want you to rejoice and let such as love the salvation say continually, let God be magnified. The word continually means this, make it the theme of your life. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's a theme of your life. It's a melody of your song. It's a banners over all your activities. It's the meaning of your home. It's the aim of your parenting. It's the design of your marriage. It's a goal of your vocation. Say continually, the Lord is magnified. Make God great. Let, him, let the world see how great he is. That's the whole purpose. And that defines for us, folks, the purpose of life. This theme, it defines for you the purpose of your marriage, the purpose of your parenting. Every area of your life is what? I want to magnify God. I want to magnify God, not make him bigger than he is, but to allow others and myself to see him as truly big as he truly is. It should be our desire as a church where the city lights of this world are giving way to the stunning night skylights of the glory of God. Our city has bright lights. You pull in at nighttime, you got the, the lights, they're trying to attract uh, uh, the world to come. And so this is what we're happy to see is, and this is where you'll find fulfillment and come and partake of, of what we have to offer. And they'll take what you've got and uh, they'll leave you with nothing left over. But we need to have lights uh, that far outshine the lights of our city so the world can see there's a brighter light, there's a greater light, there's a God that if we magnify him, they won't be as much allured in the temptation of sin because you'll see the greatness of God and they'll be drawn to God, the brightness of his life. Uh, that, what are we, so uh, then go, David goes on to say, all those that seek thee, in that verse, all those that seek thee shall rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say, can you the Lord be named? All those that seek thee. All right? So what's that mean? Seeking the Lord is what we do here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. So we put our eyes to the telescope of God's word over and over again. What are we looking for? Here's what we're looking for. Go to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse number 4. You say, we're seeking. What are you looking for? What are we seeking for? Uh, well, what is it that we're looking for if we're going to truly magnify God? David tells us in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I what? Seek after. Oh, there's one thing I desire. I've narrowed it down. It's not a bunch of goals I have this year. It's not a bunch of resolutions I have this year. It's one thing I desire. It's one thing I'm looking for. I'm seeking after. What is it? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To what? To behold. To behold the sea the beauty of the Lord, and inquire in his temple. We seek to what? To behold the beauty of the Lord, to be with him, to meditate upon him, to know him, to spend time with him. Now, look at the word love. 
as it says, we're to those that love thy salvation. In the second part of Psalm uh, uh, 40, it says, let us love thy salvation, say continually. God would have us to be passionate about our salvation. God would want us to cherish and tre treasure and embrace our salvation. Listen, God doesn't want you to be casual about him saving you. He didn't want you to be nonchalant about your salvation. He wants you to know your sins have been forgiven. You're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. You have the promise of salvation. Listen, that ought to be a love, a passion, a thrill, something you cherish, not something just sort of a, a whole hum un unconcerned. It should challenge us and be a passion that drives us. You should love your salvation. Why should we love our salvation? Because it shows us the greatness of God's love for us. But God commendeth his love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when you love your salvation, your focus is not on the salvation. It's focused on the God that loved you enough to offer salvation to you. It's the love of a God that says, for God so loved the world. Our joy, our gladness in God of our salvation is a great mirror to the telescope for others to see. And when you realize God is saving from hell and God saving from this type of lifestyle, and I'm not who I once was, then God can allow our lives to be a telescope through which others can look and see how God loved us and God will love you, how God saved us and God will save you, how God's restored our lives and God will restore your life. As you look at others whose lives have been impacted because of the impact that God has had in their life. You see, in other words, the more we love our salvation, the more we'll want others to experience that love. In Psalm 40, verse 3, look at it says, Psalm 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You see, when you find the greatness of God and you have that love for the God of your salvation and you're saying continually, let God be magnified, you're so excited what you've got, you want others to have what you have. And that's what Psalm says, many shall what? See it. See what? How great God is. How amazing God is. In, in your home, in your marriage, in your church, in your life. They see it. And because they see the greatness of God, what do they say? The Bible goes on to tell us in Psalm 40, verse 3. They see what? And they trust in the Lord. They trust in the Lord. So God says, our psalm, I'll give you a new psalm. Our psalm is our evangelism. It's our outreach. It's saying God is big. I'm going through a hard time, but there's a song in my heart. I'm going through a difficult time, but there's a song in my heart. And that song is a voice to let others know that God is bigger than our problems. God's bigger than our heartaches. God's bigger than our sorrow. And God allows others to see the greatness of God in us. And they trust the God that we're singing about because we're magnifying God. We're not belly aching, complaining, griping, upset, woe is me, life's not fair. We're saying God is great. God is great, and that's a song we sing, and others trust Him because of that. So our mission is to be a Christian observatory in the center of our city. We're called to seek God, to see Him in the telescope of His Word. We're called to rejoice and be glad in what we see. And because of the gladness of what we see, we have a song of praise in our hearts. That's worship. And that song of praise and worship in our heart, out of that worship flows evangelism and missions as we show the power and love of God uh, and welcome others to join us in this joy. We don't want to be the only ones going to heaven. We don't want to be the only ones to have a good outlook of who God is. We don't want to be the only ones who are forgiven. We want others to join with us and celebrate the wonder of knowing you're saved on your way to heaven. You're not hell bound. You're forgiven. God gives you a fresh start, a new beginning. That's what the world's looking for in a New Year's resolution. But only God God can give you a fresh start. And so we come to God and says, God, you, you, I, I've got some heartaches today. I've got some problems today. i got some worries today. And God says, I specialize in taking broken lives and rebuilding them. I specialize in taking a hurting heart and healing it. I specialize in taking that which is broken and bruised and battered and putting it all back together. That's the greatness of the God. In other words, we exist to spread a passion for the greatness and supremacy of God in all things. For all people to see, you're created, I'm created to magnify God, to point to God, to glorify God, to show off God, to cause people to think about God. We were meant to reflect God just as the moon 
is not a light of its own, but re reflects the S-U-N, sun. As a child of God, we likewise, like the moon, are not a light in of ourselves, but we reflect the light of the S-O-N, the Son, Jesus Christ. You see, your everyday life purpose is to magnify God. So this thought, magnifying God, it establishes our perspective of how you look at life. And it gives you a purpose of how to live your life. All in a single verse, you can have a mission statement, a marriage theme, a home theme, a family theme, and it says, you know what, that's going to be our theme this year. Let you join with us and magnify the Lord with me. Which means what? It's got to start with someone. Someone in the marriage has to start it. Someone in the family has to start it. Someone in the church has to start it. And so when someone starts magnifying the Lord, then we can say, would you join with me? Would you join with me? And then together we then can exalt his name together. And like a grand multitude, unnumbered multitude, together we can, what? It's not about us and me. Just a bunch of backs of people's heads and their bodies and we see them looking in, the, in a different direction we don't know their face we don't know their identity we don't know the color of their skin we have nothing to do because the focus is not on us the focus is all about him together we can glorify together we can magnify our lord together this morning there may be some here today and you cannot magnify god if you're not sure of where you'll spend eternity when you die if you're to die right now, do you have the confidence, do you have the assurance of where you'll spend eternity? If there's any uncertainty or doubt of where you'll spend eternity when you die, may I say this, there's a God in heaven that's a bigger God than whatever sins you've ever committed. You say, preacher, you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the life that I've lived. I've got a life of filled with regrets. And God says, no, you don't know how big of God, of a forgiving God that God is. And that's my job to try to make the bigness of God not bigger and, and magnifacture God that's not really that big, but it's to show you how big God is and how God loves you as unlovable as you think you may be. As unlovely as you think you are, God says, I love you. You can't change that fact that God loves you. You may not feel worthy or deserving of that love, but that doesn't change the fact that God loves you. And then God says, because of my love for you, I've made a way possible for you to be forgiven of your sins. So you don't have to pay the, pay the penalty of your sin, which is hell. I sent my son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. For God so loved the world. That's us. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever brings it down to the individual, believe in him, should not perish everlasting life. See, it's not becoming part of a Baptist church that takes you to heaven. It's not turning over a new leaf that takes you to heaven. It's not stopping a certain sin or starting of this or that or whatever else. It has nothing to do with where you spend eternity when you die. It comes down to the point of what will you do with Jesus? God offers to us a gift today. That gift is forgiveness. That gift is heaven. And God says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's no respecter of persons. God doesn't care what you've done in the past. God's a concern about what you're going to do today with the offer of salvation when he says, I'll give you a gift called heaven. Let me ask you this. If God was willing, which he is, to give you a gift called heaven, would you be willing today to receive that gift? I didn't say join the church. I didn't say turn over a new leak. I didn't say put money in the, in the offering. I didn't say do any of that. I said God's giving you a gift. Do you understand what a gift is? It doesn't cost you anything. It costs the giver something. They had to go out and buy it. They had to purchase it. So a gift is not free, but it's free to the one that it's given to. Christ paid for our gift. The cross is a continual reminder of the price that was paid for the gift of salvation that God's willing to give to us. But our choice is this, will I receive that gift? If you receive that gift, then God promises to give you home in heaven. Not because you're worthy or deserving of it, but because God loves you and he knows you can never earn it, you can never purchase it, but you could receive it. All of us can receive the gift. I may not be able to afford a gift, I may not be able to deserve a gift, but all of us can receive a gift. And so if God was willing today to give you a gift called heaven, and you don't know where you'll spend eternity when you die, are you willing to start this year off right and say, I'm willing to receive that gift and receive Christ as my Savior? If you are, God's willing, 
if you're willing. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning.